All right. Well, sorry for the uh, the challenges. Um, you won't be able to see me, but that's probably fine. So everything I'm going to talk about today, <laughs> there's a million messages coming in through the chats. Thank you. Uh, everything I'm going to talk about today is under what I've long described as sort of the one world, one health umbrella. Um, next slide, please. And and <laughs> that what that really means is uh, the work that I'm going to talk about is really all about the relationships between our own health, the health of wildlife, the health of livestock, and how all of those things are underpinned by environmental stewardship. That's that's what I mean by one health. It's an approach that takes these relationships into account. Next slide, please. So my specific topic today is called Beyond Fences, Policy Options for Wildlife, Livelihoods, and Transboundary Animal Disease Management in Southern Africa. And that, that sounds like a mouthful, but I, I think this will be a helpful uh, talk. I think it's different than most of the other talks you're gonna hear today, because I'm really not gonna talk about a zoonotic disease. Obviously, in the midst of COVID, Zoonoses are, are of focus and obviously extremely important, but I'm actually gonna talk about an animal disease that has profound impacts both on human livelihoods and on the future of conservation. Next slide, please. So the program that has that is, that is, uh, been working on, these, on the issues I'm gonna describe for years is called AHEAD, Animal and Human Health for the Environment and development. And I launched it in 2003. And basically, I see myself and my team, we are biodiplomats. We work to facilitate cross-sectoral collaboration. Uh, in the early days, often literally within a given country, bringing ministers of environment, ministers of agriculture, livestock veterinarians, wildlife veterinarians, public health people to the same table. Because in, in, including here in the US where, I'm, where I am right now, most governments are, are fairly stratified. They, they, each ministry or each agency tends to work in its own lane. And real problem solving depends on connecting up those lanes. And that's what the AHEAD program is all about. It's, it's about creating enabling environments. Next slide, please. So this, this is a, uh, a zebra, dead along a foot and mouth disease control fence. And this is the type of thing I unfortunately saw quite a bit of when I first got to Botswana in, in the early 1990s when I was Botswana's first wildlife veterinary officer for the Department of Wildlife and National Parks. But the story I wanna tell you today really goes back to the late 1950s when Botswana was the British protectorate of Bekwanaland, Zimbabwe, uh, was British Southern Rhodesia. Namibia was German Southwest Africa and then moved under South African auspices. All of the countries I'm going to talk about were either colonies or protectorates under British or German jurisdiction. And the colonial powers that be were looking for economic traction. If you're a colonialist, that's what you do. And in the late 1950s, the emphasis was on, for example, getting beef out of Southern Africa back to Europe, back to the motherland. But even in the late 1950s, the Europeans were well aware that there was a suite of viruses, foot and mouth disease viruses, that they definitely didn't want to get brought into, into Europe. This, the foot and mouth disease viruses have only one natural host that we know of in the wild, and that's the African buffalo. And that was known in the 50s. And so in order to try and move beef that was not infected with FMD from Southern Africa back to Europe, what the Europeans embarked upon was a giant infrastructure project building fences, thousands of kilometers of fences to separate buffalo and other wildlife from livestock. In other words, they were trying to keep buffalo from infecting livestock so that any beef that was exported wouldn't spread foot and mouth disease. So they built thousands and thousands of kilometers of fences over the ensuing decades. And what happened was what I will describe to you as a slow motion environmental train wreck. And what I mean by that is the decisions that were embarked upon were very monosectoral. They were only focused on beef as, an, as a resource. Nobody cared about free ranging wildlife as a resource in those days. 
And so those fences blocked migratory pathways for wildlife across the region. And over the ensuing decades, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of wild animals like the zebra died because they could no longer access grazing or fresh water at the different times of year that they needed. Most of the species in this part of the world need to migrate seasonally in order to meet their ecological needs, in order to breed with different populations, all the things you think about when migration is an important part of a life cycle. So that's, that's sort of the history of the fencing issue in Southern Africa. And that's what I call the bad news. And I'm going to quickly pivot to the good news, but you need to understand why this, this policy was put in place. And again, in the 50s, diamonds had not been discovered, for example, in Southern Africa. And so these were very poor, marginal, semi-arid lands. And livestock agriculture was one thing that, again, the British and the Germans thought they could capitalize on. Next slide, please. So just to give you more context on the fences that were created largely to keep foot and mouth disease out of, out of beef, uh, the, the line diagram on the left are just the major fences in this part of the world. And you can imagine if you're, a, say, a wildebeest and you've got to move from you know, point A to point B, you're not going to be able to navigate that matrix of fencing. Uh, the color picture is an aerial photo of a double cordon fence. The, the, you can see there are maintenance roads along the fences. Uh, and they're quite formidable. You can see them, you know, from, from satellites. So next slide, please. So typical fencing, they can be 10 to 12 feet high. Again, they're, the main ones are often double. And if they're maintained, they really do what they were intended to do. They stop wildlife from being able to move uh, and come into contact with, with livestock. They also obviously stop livestock. Next slide, please. So I, I want to now pivot to the, the good news, and I think there, there is some. The blue blobs on this map are all, there's about a dozen peace parks or transfrontier conservation areas, TFCAs. This is a relatively recent development in the past 15 to 20 years. The peace parks movement has arisen because today, nature-based tourism for Southern Africa contributes more to the gross domestic product of this part of the world than livestock agriculture, forestry, and fisheries combined. So in other words, today, nature-based tourism is extremely important in terms of being an engine of economic growth for Southern Africa. And that development, which wasn't the case in the 50s, has not been lost upon the heads of state of these countries to the point where they've recognized that they want to capitalize on their free-ranging wildlife and restore migrations and reconnect even across international boundaries so that wildlife can move again and be sustained on into future generations in order to generate economic development. So if you add up all the blue blobs on this uh, map, it, it, and again, I apologize for the US centric comparisons I'm gonna give you, but this surface area of peace parks is about the same surface area as the state of New York, the state of California, and the state of Texas combined. Those are pretty big states. This is a vast amount of land, and this isn't about creating giant national parks. It's about creative zoning, and I'm going to talk more about that. But the point is, the Peace Parks Movement in Southern Africa is the largest experiment in terrestrial conservation in the world today. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to talk about how to, how to help countries meet this, this vision for, for transfrontier conservation in the face of some of the constraints that have developed since the 50s. Next slide, please. So it's important to recognize that wildlife is actually Southern Africa's global competitive advantage. As much as there's been an interest in beef, and beef is important both locally and internationally, but the reality is globally, Africa overall contributes a, less than 1% of global beef flows. Southern Africa is never going to compete with the Brazils or the Argentinas of the world where it comes to exporting of beef. But Nobody compete with the SADC region, the Southern African Development Community, when it comes to tourism and associated nature-based economic activities. Uh, and that's something that, again, the heads of state have capitalized upon. And one of the things I hope to touch on is, is the importance of resilience. And, and I'll say this a few times. I'm not talking about choosing wildlife over livestock or vice versa. What I'm talking about is keeping both options open, which is something we've advocated for decades. You want people to have a diversified livelihoods basket 
And nothing's made that more clear than COVID. Obviously, tourism collapsed. And so in a collapsed tourism market, you want to be able to continue to feed yourselves, your family, and at least trade locally, if not regionally, in products like beef. So it's, a, it's about resilience. Next slide, please. So you'll see the term TFCAs, that, transfer, tran that stands for Trans Frontier Conservation Area, Peace Park. They were created by international treaties signed by the heads of states of the countries we're going to talk about. And they had three primary reasons for doing this. And the first one is, as I've described it, was for socioeconomic development. Secondly, they're not called peace parks by accident. Some of these very countries uh, have, in the not too distant past, been shooting at each other. There is a peace dividend to agreeing to collaborate and create corridors, wildlife paths across one's international borders. So there really is a peace component to this. And then obviously, if this is successful, it is about sustainable conservation of biodiversity, of wildlife. Next slide, please. So I'm going to focus in on one of the peace parks, one of the dozen or so I mentioned. This one is the largest. That amoeba-looking thing that you can see is the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. And I've superimposed the amoeba on the northeastern U.S. so you can see how big it is. Um, again, it's a vast area. Next slide, please. So Kaza, as it's called, is named after the two main river systems, the Kavango and Zimbizi systems, and it's shared by, again, a heads of state treaty signed by Angola, Botswana, and Namibia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And it is currently the largest envisioned terrestrial, trans terrestrial transfrontier conservation area in Africa and, frankly, in, in the world. Um, it's home to about two and a half million people and their livestock, and it's also, importantly, home to the majority of what's left of, of Africa's elephants. About 250,000 elephants live in Kaza. We believe there are fewer than a half million elephants left in Africa. So it's quite important just from the elephant perspective alone. Now, there are significant pressures on this landscape related to settlement, related to poaching. Obviously, we're going to talk about fencing. Climate change is important. Um, and if you go and look at the movie, if you will, from the 40s, 50s on up to the present, most of the wildlife species you can imagine have declined. Uh, because of the pressures we're talking about. But it's not too late to reverse those trends, fencing having played a very large role in the declines of, of many of the free-ranging wildlife species. I should also mention that in the face of climate change, when all the climate models point to an ever-drying trend in Southern Africa, dealing with fencing is also important to allow for climate change adaptation. The only way for both wildlife and pastoral people to adapt to climate change is going to be able to move to be able to move north-south. And right now, some of the major fences preclude the movement of people, their livestock, and wildlife. So there's, there's actually an added reason to consider rethinking the fencing strategy in the face of climate change. And I'm going to talk about a number of the threats to a landscape like this, but I will underscore that the management of animal diseases like foot and mouth disease, because of their importance to international trade, undermine the entire vision for peace parks. And again, it's when we talk about Kaza, it's not going to be a giant park. It's home to lots of people. There are railroads and farms and industry and mining, but it is about rezoning so that wildlife can move across this, these five countries in, in a sensible way, in a way that they have done for eons. And we need to preserve key corridors so that it can continue to do that. Next slide, please. So this is a different map of the same amoeba, and this is just to show you a few things. Anything that's sort of greenish is one form or another of a protected area. So we have national parks, we have community conservancies, we have game reserves, and if you add them all up, there are about 70 different types of protected areas of one designation of an, or another. And if we're successful in creating the connections that I've been describing, that's what makes the amoeba work. That's what allows a wildebeest or a zebra to move across this landscape. But I want to be clear, as I mentioned, it's not just fencing that is a challenge here. If you're going to participate in this as, as five countries coming together, I'll give you some examples of other things you have to reconcile to create a peace park. For example, you have to have agreements across national boundaries to deal with law enforcement. Poaching continues to be a big problem, and you've got to be able to have collaboration, say, between Botswana and Namibia so that law enforcement can collaborate across an international boundary so that poachers can't easily escape just by crossing 
you know, a, a, a national border. You've got to have harmonization of legislation. You've got to have collaboration among law enforcement authorities. Similarly, you've got to have a way to share revenues, um, to harmonize customs and immigration. If you're going to advocate for international tourism, you've got to make it relatively easy for tourists to move across this landscape and not get hung up uh, at every major border crossing. And there's been progress on things like what we call um, uh, a univisa, where you can, as a tourist, get one visa that allows you to move across the five countries. Um, just as a comment, I see someone in the chat said they can't see me. We're, we're aware that I can't be seen right now. We might be able to rectify that in the Q&A, but because I wasn't able to show the slides from my computer, Leah is showing everything. Uh, so you'll just have to hear my melodious voice. So let's move to the next slide now that I've told you about a few of the challenges in creating this landscape. Now this unfortunately um, is not gonna work because I had to use a PDF today, but um, anyone who's interested can contact the organizers afterwards. I've got a three minute video uh, that I was gonna show that shows the history of the fences going up. And basically if you picture uh, it's focused on Botswana, a country the size of France. Since the 50s on up to the present, you can see in animation fence after fence go up over time to the point where the entire country is crisscrossed by fences. But it's it was a nice to show, not essential. So let's move on and we'll save three minutes right there. So what I'm talking about today is what I call large landscape conservation. And I do a lot of things in my role uh, at Cornell, but this is my favorite program because the opportunity to have impact at scale is unprecedented. If we can secure a future for some of Southern Africa's most iconic wildlife, including elephants, because of our expertise in animal health, then we'll really have achieved something. So I, I'm, I'm, I want to share my enthusiasm for the great collaborations we, we've been in, you know, privileged to enjoy with our government partners across CASA. Next slide, please. I want to be clear again, and this is true in most conservation endeavors, it really all comes down to the human dimension and about thinking about uh, human needs and human aspirations and the realities of poverty and poverty alleviation. Uh, when I was much younger, I, there was a point in time where I thought conservation was about wildlife, and I, I wish that was the case. It's, it's all about human needs, and it's about human behaviors. Next slide, please. And that, that only reemphasizes the importance of looking at balance in, in how people can make a living. And there is no way to have conservation success in, in this part of the world uh, unless you take livestock into account. Livestock have been in Southern Africa since 600 AD. Um, I would ask, um, can, we save, can we save the questions to the end? I'm gonna leave time and then we can run through the questions. Would that be okay? Because it's hard for me to follow the chat at the same time. Maybe you can nod, Leah, if that's okay. Okay. Okay, so we'll do that though. Uh, we're definitely gonna have time at the end. So all this to say that our work is very much about thinking about how to integrate both the needs of the livestock sector and the needs of the wildlife sector. Next slide, please. So the good news for you guys in the audience is I'm not gonna make you all into epidemiologists today, but I wanted to point out that when you have among the most diverse assemblages of ungulates, wild ungulates anywhere in the world in Southern Africa, you're also gonna have among the most diverse assemblages of what we call transboundary animal diseases. There are a lot of animal diseases in this part of the world. I'm sure that doesn't surprise many of you. I've just listed a number of them here. I'm gonna focus on foot and mouth disease primarily because it is the one that drives fencing policy because of foot and mouth being right now probably the most economically important disease to animal agriculture because nobody wants to import foot and mouth into their country. You may remember that's happened in the not distant past in the United Kingdom, in South Korea, where foot and mouth has accidentally gotten in and it causes billions of dollars of, of economic damage. So that's why countries are concerned about it. Next slide, please. So I, I wanna just review some of the things I've thrown at you so far that we basically are working under what I call a land use conundrum. There are, there are some fundamental conflicts 
between sectors. So the Transfrontier Conservation Area or Peace Park concept does require these, this free movement of wildlife that I've been talking about over large areas. But up until very recently, the, the only internationally accepted approach for managing these transboundary animal diseases like foot and mouth has been to prevent movement through things like fences. So we recognized 20 years ago that the vision for peace parks and the current approach to managing diseases are fundamentally incompatible. And yet, to really achieve sustainable livelihoods, we needed to find a new paradigm because the system has actually been failing. And we're going to go into that next. Next slide, please. So just again, using Botswana as an example, because it's the place I've spent most, most of my personal time in. This is just a map showing you Botswana's uh, disease management zones. And you can see the top part of the country is pink or red. That's called the red zone. And it's red because, sorry about this. Um, okay, so what I was saying was that even in, in under the historical fence-based way of managing this problem, the poorest of the poor farmers in the northern part of Botswana still didn't have international access to beef markets. So that's a problem in and of itself. So I don't want people to think that the good old days were all that good for everybody. Okay, next slide, please. So the other thing that's important to recognize is that, and this is a little bit like, there's a lot of lessons in COVID here. Um, when, when foot and mouth disease, this is, this is a slide showing the incidence of foot and mouth in three, region, three countries in the region, Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa, decade by decade. And you can see when there was a, uh, that red line, there's a precipitous dip in the incidence of foot and mouth. That was after vaccines were introduced um, in, in, the, in the, around the late 80, late early 80s. Uh, and then you can see that since then, uh, towards more current times, foot and mouth incidences have, have uh, foot and mouth incidence has increased fairly dramatically in the three countries for a, a range of reasons that we don't completely understand. Part of it might be that there's been drift in the topotypes of FMD and the vaccines that are in production may no longer be matching the field strains. Part of it is that the colonial era did end and fencing is actually quite expensive to maintain. And you know, developing countries have lots of priorities. And so fencing infrastructure has not always been maintained. So there's a possibility that that's part of why foot and mouth is increasing. Um, and there's been more you know, movements of livestock, some of it illegal. So there's lots of potential reasons. But the bottom line is, despite best intentions, the old system based on vaccines and fences has not worked recently. And we've had dozens and dozens of outbreaks on into the present in the past few decades. So that that is a problem. And for me as a conservationist, when there's a big challenge, that means there's also a big opportunity. And we're going to we're going to tackle that opportunity now. Next slide, please. And next slide. Okay, so this is that amoeba again. And what I've put in here are those red circles with arrows through them are six of the most important migratory corridors for wildlife across Kaza, across the five country landscape. And almost all of them are currently compromised by either a combination of fences, human habitation, natural boundaries like rivers, but fencing is a primary problem for all of these migrations that again, before the 50s, for, for millennia, wildlife was moving freely back and forth. Now we have this challenge and, and we've, got to, we've got to recognize that we won't achieve the vision for transfrontier conservation in Kaza unless we figure out a different way to manage FMD, foot and mouth disease. Next slide, please. So I want to I want to put a finer point on that. So this is a close up. Um, hopefully, many of you are familiar with the Okavango Delta. This is an, the corner of northern Botswana. The Okavango Delta is labeled Marimi Game Reserve. It's one of the seven wonders of the world. It is the world's largest fresh freshwater inland delta. It's it's an extraordinary place. If you've ever watched, maybe some of you have traveled there, but if you've ever watched a documentary about lions and elephants in in the swamps of Botswana, it was filmed here. The yellow and black lines on this map are foot and mouth disease control fences. And on the video I wasn't able to show you, you could have seen how the fences went up over time. And what's happened is that pocket there where I have some red arrows, there are 
about 18,000 elephants bottled up in that corner where I've got those red arrows. So you see Babwata National Park is part of the Zambezi region of Namibia. Under that Babwata National Park at the very top of the slide is a yellow and black line. That's the Zambezi fence. And you can see there's a, a basically the elephants are stitched in a pocket and there are 15,000 people living in that pocket. And as elephants populations continue to grow, the amount of conflict between people and elephants is extraordinary. Right now, uh, there is no way for the elephants in that pocket to, to disperse. And what we ideally want them to be able to do is go north into the Zambezi region of Namibia and on into Angola, which is above Namibia there. But the fencing has precluded that. And one of the interesting things is that the reasons for that, some of the fencing that are, that's currently there may no longer be valid. Uh, one, one of the reasons for some of this fencing was a disease called contagious bovine pleural pneumonia, which is not a wildlife disease. It's a disease of livestock. And that disease is currently a little bit better managed in Namibia than it was in the mid nineties when this fence was put up. Much of this fencing was put up as an emergency response. So there is an opportunity to potentially revisit that fence, allow elephants to restore their historical migrations. And the real benefits are huge for farmers who, who are suffering from elephants eating their crops routinely and, and breaking into their grain stores. So there is a, there is a real win-win here if we can get this policy right. Next slide, please. So again, successful conservation in this part of the world depends on successful rural development, on alleviation of poverty, and that is tied to a multi-sectoral approach. We need livestock agriculture and biodiversity conservation for rural development. We have to recognize that attempts to control foot and mouth with fences is actually now hurting both sectors. Uh, the farmers are mad at wildlife for, for being bottled up. Wildlife conservationists are mad at the fencing policy for inhibiting migrations. And as I just described, conflict is actually getting worse, not better. So we've got to do something differently. Next slide, please. All right, I, I didn't know the PDF was going to capture all this. So we'll go to the next slide because I just I just reviewed that. All right, so we've got all of these problems that we, we have to address. Next slide. So there are key challenges for policymakers. Uh, and I can tell you that I think there was a, a question that we can get to more in detail later, but it was about buy-in by the regional and local authorities to the treaty that, that set up CASA. And I can tell you that there's still work to be done, but these, these countries do take these commitments seriously and they want these problems that I've been describing solved. So we, we have to recognize that in order to fix this, foot and mouth disease is not an eradicable disease. I think for many years, the Europeans had pushed the idea that we could eradicate foot and mouth from Southern Africa. We're just never going to be able to do that. The only way to get rid of foot and mouth in this part of the world would be to kill all the buffalo. And nobody in their right mind wants to do that. Buffalo are incredibly important ecologically, and they're really important economically for tourism. And in those countries where there's trophy hunting, they're important for that as well. So eradicating buffalo is not an option. There's, for the first time in decades, a growing recognition that the currently accepted or until recently accepted fence-based approach to managing FMD has actually been failing. Uh, and that right now we're in a lose-lose situation. Foot and mouth is on the rise. The conservation sector is not able to thrive in the face of these fences. So something's got to give. And that's, that's where we think we have a solution. Next slide. So we need a solution that does three things. We have to help Southern African pastoralists and farmers. They're amongst our most important stakeholders. These are the people who live closest to wildlife and will decide whether there will be wildlife for future generations. We have to recognize that countries who wanna buy beef have to feel safe, that any product they buy is gonna be safe. Um, hold on one second here, I'm getting another computer challenge here, sorry. Hold on one second, all right.
Okay, sorry, I don't know what's going on here. Okay, so we have to find a solution that helps the farmers who are key stakeholders, as I alluded to. We have to find a way to solve the foot and mouth problem that doesn't be continue to be a threat to the existence of free range and wildlife. And as I mentioned, we have to be able to provide confidence to anyone who wants to buy this beef that it's not gonna threaten their own domestic agriculture. Next, next slide, please. So uh, I, you know, I'm I'm a wildlife oriented veterinarian. I was a vet student, not you know, well, in the in the 80s, and uh, I wasn't that interested in beef. I actually don't even eat beef, but I've had to learn an awful lot about it. And it turns out the solution all relates to how beef can be made safe as a commodity. Um, next slide. So I'm going to digress into a mini lecture for you guys. You won't get this anywhere else on the fascinating nuances of international trade regulations. And this sounds very dry, but it's actually really important. It turned out to be the solution we were looking for. So in the world, the World Trade Organization, WTO, has what's called the Sanitary and Phytosanitary Committee. They pretty much oversee the rules to make sure that we don't get sick from products that we eat and animal, and that animals don't get sick from international trade and contaminated products. But there are two international bureaucracies that are very separate to do that. On the right side of this, this diagram is what's called the Codex Alimentarius, and that's administered by the UN, by the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, and the World Health Organization, WHO. And the Codex Alimentarius are basically the rules that are agreed to by virtually all the countries in the world for food safety reasons. And it focuses on how foods are handled and processed. It's very much focused on production on how products are eventually safe when they're made available to consumers so that you ideally don't get sick from something that you eat. It's very product process focused. And that's a good thing, it makes sense. The other side of the diagram is the international bureaucracy created to manage the movements of animals and animal products, meat, eggs, milk, etc. And it's administered by a completely separate system under the OIE, based in Paris, the World Organization for Animal Health. Most people don't realize the OIE is actually not part of the UN system. It's older than the UN. And their system for managing the movements of animal diseases is based on the source of the product. Where was that animal sourced? Did that cow grow up near an African buffalo? It was not really focused on how the product is processed. And so over many years, my colleagues and I working on this challenge went to the two bureaucracies, to FAO, WHO, and OIE, and said, wait a minute, you guys with these two separate systems are trying to achieve the same objective. You're trying to make sure that the products that consumers get exposed to are safe in terms of viruses, bacteria, and parasites. But one of you is doing it focused on how the product is processed, and one of you is doing it based on the geography, the zoning, the fencing of where that product was made or, or, or initiated. And that's a lot of work, particularly for the developing world. And to make a very long story short, and I'm, I'm compressing many years of policy engagement, we were able to convince the powers that be at the OIE that this was actually unfair and that for beef, you could actually focus on how it's produced. And we know that if you slaughter a cow and you debone the, the carcass and you age the beef and you take out the lymph nodes and the pH drops below six as it does because of lactic acidosis, that beef is not going to have any viable foot and mouth disease virus left in it if that cow happened to have any FMD. And it took a lot of work, but we we're able to demonstrate that that's a true fact and that you could rely on processing, on hazard analysis, critical control points along the value chain from the field to the fork so that you could ensure beef was a safe product even if cows live near wildlife. That was a huge breakthrough. Next slide. I'm gonna just give you a commercial now. Um, one of the things I'm not able to do today is show you a 20 minute video that we filmed in the region on these issues. It's on my homepage of the website, which I'll show you at the end, Beauty and the Beef. You can just click on it and watch it filmed in, in the Okavango, and it tells the story better than it's, if, if, you, if you watch it, I'm willing to give you your money back if it's not the best film about foot and mouth disease and fences you've ever seen. So I normally show that to students, but we didn't have time to do that today. But it captures a lot of what I'm describing. So next slide, please. 
So what I was describing was the solution based on value added processing instead of fencing. And after science-based advocacy with the OIE and all the chief veterinary officers of the world, in 2015, the OIE changed the international rules that I was describing to you. They changed what's called the Terrestrial Animal Health Code, which are the rules that the entire planet abides by in terms of the safe trade of products like beef. And they agreed that if you debone your meat and you take out the lymph nodes and you age it appropriately, as shown in these pictures, you can produce a safe product that's equivalent to, whether, to a product that might have produced through a fencing-based system to separate wildlife and livestock. And this is called commodity-based trade, or CBT. And this is allowing countries like the countries that comprise the Kaza Peace Park to revisit producing beef, even in the northern part, where in that red zone I showed you, they've never had access to international markets. Today, because of this change in international rules, they can sell their beef and revisit whether some of those fences are, are, are potentially removable and that those elephants that are bottled up causing conflict could be freed to cross back across the landscape and restore their ancient migrations. So through the ar arcane details of animal health policy, we've been able to find an internationally accepted solution that allows beef trade to, to continue and even expand and potentially to allow some of the fences that are impeding the vision for peace parks to be revisited and potentially some of them to be removed. Next slide, please. Now, I want to be clear, there's a lot I wasn't able to share in today's discussion, but it's all in the scientific literature. We publish a lot on the work that we do. And again, all these papers are freely available. They're all on our website. But we, we've written papers that the chief veterinary officers of the world can read and understand and accept. And so I, I, we don't lobby, but we do use science to influence policy. That's a key part of what the AHEAD program does. Next slide. But the other really important thing we do, remember, I think my second or third slide, I talked about getting people to the same table. And we still do that. Here is a slide from a big meeting we held in the region in 2012, where we had SADC, the OIE, WHO, FAO, farmers, ministers, and it was all about this problem. And the SADC countries, the Southern African De Development Community countries, produced something called the Pakalani Declaration on the adoption of these non-geographic approaches, non-fence-based approaches to management of foot and mouth. It was a very powerful statement that they put out publicly. And that statement in 2012 really helped change the debate in the World Organization for Animal Health in the OIE to the point where they changed those rules that I mentioned. So the power of bringing sectors together that normally don't collaborate is not to be underestimated. And it seems so basic, but nobody was doing it. There were no incentives for anyone to invest in getting the livestock sector and the wildlife sector to really talk, even though their missions were related to the very same land base. So that's been the secret sauce of our engagement is, is helping people explore their problems. And often it's done over breaking bread, over a beer. It's really important. A lot of this comes down to creating relationships um, that really underpin what seem like very complicated bureaucracies, but ultimately are driven by individual human beings. Next slide, please. So again, the question for years was sort of a false one. Can we have tourism or beef? And the answer we think we've come up with is you can have both because of this new approach to producing safe beef by focusing on the commodity under these new rules. And this is a breakthrough, as I've been describing. It's a breakthrough for the poorest farmers in this part of the world. And it's a potential breakthrough for African wildlife if we want to really see peace parks become a reality. Next slide. Well, the other thing we've done is we've, we've compiled guidelines on how to do this. How do you produce this beef? And these are our guidelines, again, freely available in the public domain on how to produce this beef. They're very concise with diagrams, very clear. And this, this document in particular was recently adopted officially by SADC, which is basically the EU of Southern Africa. And it's, it's now an official document of SADC and all the SADC countries, which are all the countries from Tanzania all the way south towards South Africa, abide by it. So that's a huge policy win. Next slide. Similarly, we helped the country of Botswana do what we call a gap analysis. We looked at their current situation, their legislation, their capacity, 
and, and help them figure out, basically develop a roadmap on how to change the way they resolve this conflict between wildlife and livestock. This is a very detailed but user-friendly document written in partnership with farmers and government of Botswana stakeholders. So now that they have a guide, basically, it's a living document that they can use to help farmers and their veterinary services produce safe beef and reconsider fences. Uh, very practical, that's, that's another service we have provided. Next slide. So all this work really is about advancing health. It's about thinking about how we value ecosystems and it's about securing livelihoods and underpinning poverty alleviation. Uh, I, I, to me, this is, this is, this AHEAD program is probably, it may well be the first applied One Health program. We launched it before we actually launched the One World, One Health initiative in the following year in 2004. And I, I wanted to speak with you guys today because One Health is often thought of as only about zoonotic diseases, but it's not. This triangle is the basis of One Health. And One Health really is an equilateral triangle. Diseases that impact wildlife, livestock, people, landscapes, they all need to be considered. Obviously, zoonoses are an important component, but I want you to think about One Health in a very holistic way. And this example is really a great one because we have an animal disease that has had a huge impact on all the other sectors in the same landscape. And by rethinking how we manage an animal disease, we are actually able to rethink how a landscape can generate sustainable livelihoods through a diversified livelihood basket, livestock, wildlife, wildlife-based tourism, et cetera. And so we've probably got a few more years to go. We're working very closely with, with the, the five Kaza countries right now. We actually help them in their official meetings on animal health issues in what's called the Kaza Animal Health Working Group. So I don't want you to underestimate how much um, policy really underpins what you what happens in the real world it can seem very dry but as someone like me who used to hang out of a helicopter darting elephants and rhinos my most personal rewarding work has actually been in the policy arena because the scale of impact really can be significant now i'm not pretending that we're done we still got a ways to go but it's it's a very exciting time in having seen countries receptive to rethinking their approaches to these sectors in the interest again of the sustainable development um, next slide. Yeah, so that's the website where you can watch Beauty and the Beef, etc. And I don't know how much time we have, Leia, uh, but I, I'm happy to stay on as long as you let me to respond to any questions.